Unit 17 Gateway 1 to 3 Olivia and her sister Ellie were standing with Grandma in the middle of the cabbages. Suddenly, Grandma asked, Do you know what a cabbage white is? Yes, I learned about it in biology class. It's a beautiful white butterfly, Olivia answered. Right, but it lays its eggs on cabbages, and then the caterpillars eat the cabbage leaves. So why don't you help me to pick the caterpillars up? Grandma suggested. The two sisters gladly agreed and went back to the house to get ready. Soon, armed with a small bucket each, Olivia and Ellie went back to Grandma. When they saw the cabbage patch, they suddenly remembered how vast it was. There seemed to be a million cabbages. Olivia stood, open-mouthed, at the sight of the endless cabbage field. She thought they could not possibly pick all of the caterpillars off. Olivia sighed in despair. Grandma smiled at her and said, Don't worry, we are only working on this first row here today. Relieved, she and Ellie started on the first cabbage. The caterpillars wriggled as they were picked up while cabbage whites filled the air around them. It was as if the butterflies were making fun of Olivia. They seemed to be laughing at her, suggesting that they would lay millions more eggs. The cabbage patch looked like a battlefield. Olivia felt like she was losing the battle, but she fought on. She kept filling her bucket with the caterpillars until the bottom disappeared. Feeling exhausted and discouraged, she asked Grandma, Why don't we just get rid of all the butterflies so that there will be no more eggs or caterpillars? Grandma smiled gently and said, Why wrestle with Mother Nature? The butterflies help us grow some other plants because they carry pollen from flower to flower. Olivia realized she was right. Grandma added that although she knew caterpillars did harm to cabbages, she didn't wish to disturb the natural balance of the environment. Olivia now saw the butterfly's true beauty. Olivia and Ellie looked at their full buckets and smiled. Exercise 1 to 3 One participant of a workshop told a particularly insightful story about his twin six-year-old boys. As any parent knows, riding the school bus without mom or dad is scary enough for a first grader. But finding the way from the classroom to the bus at 3.30 by themselves is even more intimidating. There are so many buses, and they all look the same. His six-year-old spent most of the school year getting comfortable with their exact route and pickup point every day. Then, one day they were told their pickup spot was going to change. In the days leading up to the big switch, it became evident that one of the twins was very concerned, while the other seemed unaffected. Apparently, the new pickup spot was just outside one boy's classroom. He could see it from the window. But for the other boy, in a different classroom, the pickup spot was even farther away, and in a different direction. The night before the big day, shortly after bedtime, Dad noticed one child sleeping soundly, while the other was restless. He got his nervous little boy out of bed and asked him what was wrong. I don't know what I'm going to do, Daddy. So Dad dressed the little boy up in his school clothes already laid out for the next day and they went on an imaginary journey. Pretend you're in class, and the teacher says it's time to go. Walk out that door and show me which way you're going to turn. The little one did as Dad asked. Now let's practice walking down the hall and across the parking lot to the pickup spot. Two good attempts convinced both father and child that all was well. Now, who else in your class rides the same bus with you? Johnny B does. Okay, then you pretend I'm Johnny B. You practice asking me if it's okay if you follow me to the bus. After two or three attempts, the boy found a comfortable way to ask. 
Now he had a plan B. After a few more words of reassurance, Dad tucked his confident young man in bed, and he fell right to sleep. What Dad realized was that people, even children, aren't really afraid of change. They're afraid of not being prepared for the change. Exercise four to six. As part of a peace delegation, Elliot was invited to tour the former Soviet Union in 1983 at the height of the Cold War. Travel in Russia was tense at that time and included frequent searches by Soviet police and political posturing by officials. But the Russian people were friendly and gracious. Elliot was invited to a Russian home. And served an elaborate dinner, even though he knew the family's financial resources were scarce. The photos that he took that evening of three lively generations living together in one small apartment were precious to him. The next day, Elliot decided to rest at his hotel instead of joining his delegation on a field trip. Later that afternoon, he took a walk through the neighborhood with his camera. After he stopped to photograph a little boy on a red tricycle, the child disappeared into a long line of people. Immediately, the crowd began to complain vigorously about the photo Elliot had just snapped of the little boy. The fuss caused Elliot to remember that he had been expressly told never to photograph people in lines, and he had already witnessed two other delegates' films exposed to light. After such an incident, in the blink of an eye, Elliot found himself face to face with a large policeman, who asked him in broken English to give him his camera. Smiling politely and apologizing, Elliot pushed the camera and its precious film deep into the backpack he held tightly in his arms, and pretended he didn't understand what the policeman was asking him. This exchange continued for a few moments until the policeman signaled for Elliot to accompany him to the police station, which turned out to be several miles away. There, he was passed from one group to another, each of apparently higher rank than the last. Finally, there was a phone call to someone who sounded like an official. He could make out the words "American camera," but not much else. At the end of the call, the man shrugged, smiled embarrassedly, and indicated that Elliot was free to go. When Elliot described what had happened to the other members of his delegation, they asked him why he didn't immediately hand over the film. His answer was, "If he had threatened me, I would have. If the demand sounded aggressive or anyone laid a hand on me, I would have given in. But that didn't happen, so I held my ground." Exercises seven to nine. While the lion's share of the world's attention at the 1988 Olympic Games in Seoul went to track and field, an amazing story took place in the obscure sport of sailing. Canadian Larry Lemieux overcame tough 35 knot winds and was in position to claim a medal in the fin class competition. However. When he saw a capsized boat on a nearby course with injured Singapore sailors in trouble, he abandoned his race to help them. Although his actions cost him a medal, it powerfully illustrated to the world that athletic victory alone isn't everything. Shaw Hersiu and Joseph Chan's boat had capsized about 19 miles off the coast of Busan. Most competitors would have tried to pick up the gold medal. But as Lemieux told the Edmonton Journal, his instincts directed him elsewhere. The first rule of sailing is: you see someone in trouble, you help him. Lemieux said, "If I went to them and they didn't really need help, c'est la vie. If I didn't go, it would be something I would regret for the rest of my life." He didn't want to chance living with that guilt. However, once he made the decision. Rescuing the stranded sailors still wasn't easy. There were twelve-foot waves crashing all around, and the current was against the wind. Lemieux had to sail downwind to reach Chan, and took on a lot of water in the process. Skillfully, 
Lemieux kept his own boat from capsizing, pulled Chen out of the water, and then headed back to help Siu. Afterwards, he kept his small boat steady until a Korean Navy boat arrived, and then returned to the race and finished 21st out of a field of 32. As he told the journal, he had no regrets. Chan would have been lost at sea had he not been found. Because the waves were so high you couldn't see the big orange course markers when you were between troughs, so looking for someone's head would have been like looking for a needle in a haystack. I could have won gold, but in the same circumstances, I would do what I did again. Exercises 10 to 12 As a kid, I had a steady diet of programs like Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. I always thought it was amazing that Mr. Rogers had an entire magical land of make-believe with characters, stories, and a trolley that ran through his home. He was my hero, second only to my father, who was a policeman in my heart. One day my father strapped me into the car seat of his big Cadillac as we traveled to the Harrisburg International Airport to pick up my Uncle George. Once my father spotted him, they proceeded to the baggage claim to grab his luggage. I held my father's hand, happy to be accompanying him on a mission, until suddenly I broke away from him. My father hadn't noticed because he was busy removing bags from the conveyor belt. It had only been a moment, but a moment was all it took to send my father into a tailspin. He began to search frantically for me, calling my name, but there was no response. It was then that my father turned around, and he spotted me with a man at the baggage claim kiosk, maybe thirty feet away from him. He sprang into action before my uncle had a chance to stop him, and ran to the man shaking my hand. With one hand on his police-issued weapon, he asked the man to step away from me slowly. The man complied, and very calmly explained himself to my father at the same time. He told my father that I ran up to him, and that it wasn't uncommon for children to do so, simply because they felt safe in his presence. Fueled by adrenaline, concern, and anger, my father was infuriated at this man until I said to him, Daddy, why are you mad at Mr. Rogers? My father's normally chocolate complexion turned red with embarrassment. He apologized profusely to Mr. Rogers, and then they both had a good laugh. Immediately, my uncle, my father, and Mr. Rogers began to explain to me why it was so important that I'd never run away from the adult who was in charge of taking care of me at the time. From that day forward, I never departed from my caretakers.